it, and it sounds ridiculous, but how many times does Jesus get forgotten about in our plans and our agendas? I have a simple question for you to start off today. So what is the purpose of the church? It's a, it's a simple question, and I think it has a simple answer. I think the purpose of the church is to be a Jesus-centered community where people are invited and welcome to study and to practice the teachings of Jesus Christ to love God and to love neighbor. I mean, that's really it, folks. Uh, anything else that we do, anything else I believe has a tendency or a chance to help us to stray away from that simple purpose, and it is to forget our purpose as followers of Jesus Christ, as his body, as his church, as we have heard the last few weeks from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. This is a common theme that they struggled with back then as well. And so don't hear me wrong. Don't think that I, I'm, I always say, I believe in a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? But if you don't take the medicine, the spoonful of sugar is just eating candy, right? And so uh, I, I think that we should have good things. I think we should have fun things. I think we should have uh, stuff like we're going to do for spring break. We're going to have uh, times for meals, and we're going to have times for activities, and we're going to do things to build community and fun. And I think that that helps encourage and enable discipleship. But if all we do is meals and activities and fun, we've kind of missed the purpose of it. So we're going to be doing some service as well. I'm sure Kevin told you about it earlier. You can come and join us for a canned food drive or the United Methodist men are going to be doing projects. You can join them. We could do the fun, but we should also do the important things as well. And it's a simple concept. And yet so much of what I think takes up our time and our energy and our even our finances, even here at the church, has very little to do often with Jesus and his teachings or his purpose for us as the body of Christ that we call the church. There's a wonderful book by a name named Jim Collins. He It's called Good to Great. It's a business book. I'm sure many of you have read it. And in the book, he talks about uh, companies that are in the same market space, but why some companies do better than others, even though they're in the same kind of business. Uh, and so one of the insights that he draws for why some groups do better than others, it's a principle that he uses a metaphor of a bus. And he says that great companies get the wrong people off the bus, then they get the right people onto the bus, and then they get the right people in the right seats. He calls it first who, then what. I believe that great churches get their who right first. And this isn't about getting the right pastor or the right staff person or getting the right leaders onto teams or committees or whatever. I believe that great churches get their who right first, and the who is Jesus Christ. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to think about something right now. Think about the last time you got annoyed here at church or you got upset with something here at church. I want you to, don't, don't share that out. We're not having a publicly, you know, this is not sharing moment. But I want you to think about it for yourself. Now, ask yourself this question. Did it have anything to do with Jesus Christ? Probably not. Was it about Jesus Christ not being focused on or listened to? Or was it that you felt that you were not being focused on or listened to? In the first week of this Lenten series we're calling Warped, uh, talking about how the church sometimes can lose its way, Pastor Kevin talked about how sometimes we are like consumers at church. That we're, it's like being at a restaurant and we're expecting service rather than being members of one community, one body, the body of Christ. So that last thing that upset you at church, uh, were you upset that as a consumer at FUMC that you did not receive the services or to your level of expectation or to your requirement? Question. All right, so one of the things that uh, Jim Collins says that great companies do is that they get the wrong people off the bus. To be great, the church has to get the wrong priorities off the bus. I do believe that at times there are agendas and voices that have led us, that we, sorry, we have agendas and voices that we have to get off the bus. There are voices and agendas that have nothing to do with Jesus Christ, his grace, his teaching, his forgiveness, etc. And we have to stop listening to those voices that call us away from Jesus Christ, even in the life 
of the church, and we have to stop being nice, and we have to start being good. Maybe you've seen this on social media. I saw this a couple weeks ago, and I really liked it. It was the rapper LL Cool J. Who remembers LL Cool J? Anybody? Yeah. But I saw this video where LL Cool J was saying, I'm not a nice guy. I'm a good guy. And he explained the difference. He said, if somebody comes by and steals a woman's purse, a nice guy will go over and go, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. That was terrible. He said, a good guy will grab a hold of the guy, slam him in the ground, get the purse back, and hand it back to you. And he said, I'm not a nice guy. I'm a good guy. I believe that we have been too nice for too long, and we have let toxic and even idolatrous voices lead us away, away from Jesus Christ and away from the, his purpose for us as the church. And we don't have to kick them out of church. I'm not saying that. But I do think that we have to kick them out of our heads. We need to stop pretending that they are not who they are, and we have to stop listening to anything that they say that leads us away from Jesus Christ. Great churches get the who right. They put Jesus on the bus first. But too often, I think, we leave Jesus standing on the corner. So this happens even in the church work. Uh, I was in a church worship planning meeting one time. Not here, so don't believe that that's here. Uh, but as I was working, we were working as a staff, and we had met for hours, and we discussed music, and we discussed social media, and we discussed activities, and all this stuff. And at the end of the meeting, we were getting, everyone's preparing to leave, and one of our associate pastors, a, a really great guy, and not trying to be funny at all, raised his hand and asked this simple question. But when are we going to talk about Jesus? And it's then that the whole group realized that Jesus had been totally forgotten in hours of discussion. So we all had to sit back down and get back to work. But a worship service without Jesus. And it sounds ridiculous, but how many times does Jesus get forgotten about in our plans, in our agendas? You know, when I first came to this church two years ago, we were doing a, a bunch of surveys, and I read a bunch of them. And uh, i got to be honest, many, and if not most, of the surveys have very little to do with Jesus. I read complaints about this or that, but very little about Jesus. And I've sat in leadership meetings here and uh, the, where the, the agenda seems to often have very little to do with Jesus. I, there's this tendency that we can forget our purpose as a church just like the church in Corinth. Uh, so uh, hear Paul's letter to them, but also hear it as a new letter for us today. Our text today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is verses 1 through 10. This is why we don't get discouraged, given that we receive this ministry in the same way that we receive God's mercy. Instead, we reject secrecy and shameful actions. We don't use deception, and we don't tamper with God's word. Instead, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God by the public announcement of the truth. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are on the road to destruction. The God of this age has blinded the minds of those who don't have faith so that they couldn't see the light of the gospel that reveals Christ's glory. Christ is the image of God. We don't preach about ourselves. Instead, we preach about Jesus Christ as Lord, and we describe ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. God said that the light should shine out of the darkness. He said that the same one who shone in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay pots so that the awesome power belongs to God and doesn't come from us. We are experiencing all kinds of trouble, but we aren't crushed. We are confused, but we aren't depressed. We are harassed, but we aren't abandoned. We are knocked down, but we aren't knocked out. We always carry Jesus' death around in our bodies so that Jesus' life can also be seen in our bodies. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so I want to go back to the text. I want to take us to the beginning part of what Paul wrote there in 2 Corinthians, I'll remind you again, he says, this is why we don't get discouraged, even, uh, sorry, this is why we don't get discouraged, given that we receive this ministry in the same way that we receive God's mercy. 
Instead, we reject secrecy and shameful actions. We don't use deception, and we don't tamper with God's word. Instead, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God by the public announcement of the truth. And given if our gospel is veiled, if it is veiled to those who are on this road of destruction, the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who don't have faith so that they couldn't see the light of the gospel that reveals Christ's glory. Christ is the image of God. So I think Paul is dealing with some shady people. Maybe you've done that in your life a time or two. And these shady people have questioned his integrity as an apostle. And Paul tells them plainly that he rejects secrecy and deception. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, this teaching in psychology. It's called pro projection. And this is when people unconsciously take uh, unwanted traits about themselves, what's going on inside, and they attribute it to someone else outside of them. Uh, I think the people of Corinth might have been projecting a little bit of their shadiness onto Paul. A side note, I want a little takeaway for today that can help you in life. If you want to know the truth about people, they'll tell you. Just listen to them. Listen how they describe everyone else. That's the truth of who they really are. little side note to take with you. So, after his first letter, Paul had... Uh, he sent this first letter and it had very little effect. And so Paul then decided to go in person and he went on what he calls this painful visit to the Corinthians. And I have a video for you. I wonder if it looks something like this. I think this is what Paul's painful visit might have looked like. If I may digress for a moment from my prepared message, I mean it when I say to you, you guys, sometimes you're bad. Don't be jerks. You're supposed to be good. I'm in my office every day and somebody comes in and they're like, hey, whoops. I'm like, don't! Dan, what is your deal? If anybody doesn't know, Dan is the worst. I took a vow to not say who was the worst, but it's Dan. You guys are making me look bad in front of God. What's that? Oh, look, it's Jesus. And he said, stop it! The word of the Lord. Stop! <laughs> okay, that got me. Uh, stop it. I love that. Uh, hey, anybody afraid that I might start calling out names? Nobody? All right. Uh, truth is, right? Truth is, hurt people hurt people. And so it is no kindness to let them limp along hurting others so that they aren't upset. That's cowardice, not love. Uh, there's a gentleman named Scott Peck uh, in his book, A Road Less Traveled. He gives a definition of love that I really like. And he says that love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. I'm going to say that again. Love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Peck goes on to say that the greatest risk of love is the risk of exercising power with humility. The most common example of this act is of loving confrontation. The reality of love is such that sometimes one person does know better than the other what is good for the other. And under these circumstances, the wiser of the two does in fact have an obligation out of loving concern for the spiritual growth of the other to confront the other with the problem. The loving person, therefore, is frequently in a dilemma, caught between the loving respect for the other's own path in life and a responsibility to exercise loving leadership that the other appears to need. Loving leadership. Love requires occasional confrontation. It requires us to be good, not nice. 
Paul's loving leadership, his willingness to lovingly confront the church at Corinth was important because without it, they might continue on as they were, not seeing what was right in front of them. Paul goes on in his letter to say, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are on the road to destruction. The American church, not just this church, but the American church is at a crossroads. Children today are growing up in the first post-Christian generation ever in this country. So loving leadership, so in loving leadership, I do have to share with you that we are going to have to operate differently as a church. That's just the reality of things if we want there to be a church in the future. And trying to recreate the past isn't going to work. If things were so effective in the past, then how did we get here? Because the American church has been in decline for over 60 years. So I know this sounds like a lot of doom and a lot of gloom, and you might be asking, but is there hope? Yes, of course there is. And there is hope. Jesus Christ is our hope, and, but we need to stay centered on Jesus. I want to go back to Paul's letter. This is at verse 5. Paul says this. He says, we don't preach about ourselves. Instead, we preach about Jesus Christ as Lord, and we describe ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. God said that the light should shine out in the darkness. He is the same one who shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. We are slaves for Jesus' sake. We are slaves, not consumers. So, is our light shining out in the darkness? Who is finding their way to Jesus Christ? Because we are reflecting Jesus' light out into the darkness. Are others coming to know to the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ because of us? Are we consumers here at FUMC, a consumer of ministry services, or are we coming to learn, to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ so that we can share Jesus Christ with the world? Are we serving as slaves? If I ask you, where are you serving as a slave in the name of Jesus Christ, could you Tell me. And remember, slaves don't get the nice jobs, the easy jobs. Slaves get the work that no one else wants to do unless they are forced to. That's what it means to be a slave. So where are you serving where it costs you that it might even be a burden to you? Because that is what will reach the hearts of a lost generation. When they see us serving, too often I believe that they mostly see us serving in ways that serve ourselves in ways that don't cost us, not in any real or profound way. And I don't know what serving as a slave means to you. I just know the purpose of the church is to tell you is that that's what it means to follow Jesus. We are all called to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus. That's Matthew 16, 24. The call of Christ is to come and follow me, but that's to the cross to take on the role of the slave, just as Jesus did. He was obedient to God all the way to his cross. So what cross have we picked up? Or did we think that was optional? If we will receive no cross, then I have to seriously question whether or not we have ever truly received Christ deep in our hearts. They cannot be separated. And I don't say that to be mean, but I do not love you if I tell you otherwise. To confess Jesus as Christ, we must confess him not just as Savior, but as Lord. And if he is Lord, then we are only slaves. Who because of Jesus do you serve? Where have you lowered yourself so that Jesus may be exalted? This is what it means to change. The Greek word here is metanoia, to become like Jesus. And if you will not change, if you will not take up the cross, Jesus may be your Savior, but he is not your Lord. The wonderful preacher, teacher, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer explained this difference in his work, The Cost of Discipleship, by explaining the difference between what he called cheap grace and what he called costly grace. Grace being God's love. Bonhoeffer wrote this. Let the Christian rest content in his worldliness and with his 
renunciation of any higher standard than the world. He is living for the sake of, of that world rather than for the sake of grace. Let him be comforted and rest assured that his possession of this grace, for grace alone, does everything. Instead of following Christ, let the Christian enjoy the consolations of his grace. That is what we mean by cheap grace. The grace which amounts to the justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and from whose sin departs. Cheap grace is not the kind of forgiveness of sin which frees us from the toils of sin. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. That's my favorite line. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, and absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, and grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in a field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price by which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ. For whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel, which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and it is grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price, and what has cost God much cannot be cheap to us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. So, as a church, have we made Jesus Christ Lord of this church? Have we sought after costly grace, or are we settling for cheap grace? Because I think this is why so many struggle to trust the church, because they see us too often talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. We don't follow Jesus when it really matters. Uh, and too often I believe that we demand to be served rather than offering to humbly serve. And too often when we serve, if we're honest, it's just to serve ourselves. If we are to proclaim Jesus as Lord, we can't afford to be like this anymore. We can't afford the price of cheap grace. Coming back to the text in verse 7, Paul tells the Corinthians, but we have this treasure in clay pots so that the awesome power belongs to God and doesn't come from us. Clay pots are fragile. They're common. And through Jesus being called to serve him, we are able to do amazing things. But not because we are amazing, but because he is. If as a church we will put Jesus at our center, amazing things will happen. And not because of amazing leadership or amazing worship services or amazing music or amazing discipleship opportunities, or amazing community events, but because of who Jesus is and who Jesus is to us. That is what makes things great. It is also what stops them. When we make church about ourselves, about our own agendas, our own egos, we will find out that we are just clay pots and that we are easily broken and unable to do what we are meant to be. Paul goes on in his letter, and says, we are experiencing all kinds of trouble, but we aren't crushed. We are confused, but we aren't depressed. We are harassed, but we aren't abandoned. We are knocked down, but we aren't knocked out. We always carry Jesus' death around in our bodies so that Jesus' life can also be seen in our bodies. When we make Jesus the center of this community, amazing things happen, but it doesn't mean that everything will always be sunshine and rainbows because... We are Jesus-centered. It doesn't mean that the rest of the world is. We will still experience all kinds of trouble. 
But in that trouble, with Jesus at our center, we will not be crushed. We will not remain depressed. We will not feel abandoned. And we may be knocked down, but we will know that we will not be knocked out. And we call that hope. Jesus Christ is our hope, and there's hope for a hurting world. Our hope as a church is to have Jesus at our center and to be at our center to be serving rather than asking to be served. And our hope for ourselves is to understand that while we are no more than clay pots, that in Jesus Christ we are the shining light out into the darkness.